All right, well, this morning we are once again looking in the book of Proverbs, and this is part two of what we started last week, talking about the subject of financial management uh, in the book of Proverbs. Uh, Last week we talked more broadly about the subject of wealth and how the Bible presents wealth uh, really as neutral. It's not a good thing, uh, not a bad thing necessarily to be rich. It really depends on how we're gaining our wealth, uh, our attitudes towards it, and how we are using it. Uh, Scripture repeatedly warns about potential dangers in this area, such as pursuing wealth for its own sake, uh, using money in selfish ways with no concern for the Lord, no concern for others. And so we are, as Christians, to think of money as a tool, a tool that we all need, we all use. The question is, how are we going to use it? And what does it look like to manage our finances wisely, using this tool of money in the way that we ought to? Today, we're sort of leaving aside the philosophical side of the issue and getting more into the practical, everyday financial management. What principles does Proverbs teach us about how specifically we are to handle our money? And we're going to be looking at this morning 11 instructions that Proverbs gives us in this area. These are all uh, basically straight out of specific Proverbs uh, in this book. Before we dive into those, though, one introductory proverb to start. Proverbs 17, verse 16 says, Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? Now, this verse can be translated a few different ways depending on how you understand it. Uh, For example, the NET uh, translates it this way. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool since he has no intention of acquiring wisdom? I think the point of this proverb is to say that money is a useless tool uh, in the hand of a fool. If someone has no intention of acquiring money, uh, if someone has no intention, I'm sorry, of acquiring wisdom, their money will be wasted and it will produce nothing. Uh, We talked about this briefly on Wednesday night during our Bible study uh, when the subject of gambling came up. And how many of those who even win the lottery and win large uh, portions of money end up wasting all of it again. They end up back in poverty uh, within a few years because they never learned how to wisely manage their money. And so, um, as we're talking about the subject of money then, the principal thing that we need is wisdom. When it comes to our finances, we need wisdom to know how exactly we ought to handle it. I think sometimes God doesn't give some people wealth because they would make poor choices with it if they had it. Uh, After Jesus gave a parable about financial management, he said these words in Luke chapter 16. He says, One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches. And if you have not been faithful in that which is in others, who will give you that which is your own? One question I think we all ought to ask ourselves, we begin to think about the day-to-day managing of our finances, is whether or not we've proven ourselves to be faithful with what we have. Faithfulness in small things leads to greater opportunities. If we're faithful in the little that we have, we'll be faithful also with much. If we're dishonest or selfish with what little we may have, we will be dishonest and selfish with much. Uh, People often say things, Christians often say things like, uh, if I were to win the lottery, I would give half of it to the church. And I always think to myself, no, you wouldn't. Uh, Especially if you're the type of person that has never given to the church uh, with what you have now. It's always easier to be generous and wise with hypothetical money rather than our actual money. We think that we would be generous, that we would be responsible if we were rich. But the reality is that we're likely to use that money in similar ways to how we use whatever money we have right now. And so today we're getting down to really practical stuff. What should each of us do with our wealth, whether we have a lot or whether we have a little? And I believe that in many cases, as we prove ourselves to be capable of handling whatever money we may have, in ways that are wise and God-glorifying, often God will then give us more money to manage. Going to work through our way through these 11 instructions in Proverbs that the book gives us now as to how we are to handle our finances wisely. And the first one 
is a hard one. It's a simple one. And that is to take ownership for your financial situation. Uh, This, again, is the primary teaching of the book of Proverbs on the subject of money. Proverbs 10, verse 4, for example, says, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. The difference here between one who is poor and one who is rich in this proverb is their choices. Uh, Their actions determined their financial situation, and that's the case for the vast majority of people. Not all. Some are dealing with health health issues, disabilities, uh, things like that, and so they may not have the same opportunities. But for the most part, your own decisions, your own habits, are what is going to determine how you're doing financially. Uh, The wise person in Proverbs 10 works diligently and plans ahead. You notice there he's gathering in summer, he's storing up saving for the coming winter. Whereas the slothful fool sleeps and is inactive. And Proverbs calls that that lifestyle shameful. Proverbs 19 verse 15 says, Slothfulness casts into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. Again, Proverbs 13 verse number 4 says, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Uh, One more here, Proverbs 21, verse 25, The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. All of these Proverbs are, are stressing to us this very simple point, that actions determine financial consequences. And so the first thing we each need to do is decide to be responsible, to take ownership for our own financial situation. Uh, We're going to talk more about saving and spending and debt and budgeting and all of that. But first of all, get this point straight. If you're up to your eyes in debt, if your credit score is terrible or whatever, don't blame everyone else and everything else in your life for that. Take ownership for your financial situation and decide to make the necessary changes to fix it if it's not good. And all of these Proverbs are telling us that through diligence and wisdom, we can find abundance. We can over time, get ourselves to a better financial situation, making consistently wise choices over a long period of time. So here we are on the subjects of how, to, how Proverbs teaches us to manage wealth. Number one, take ownership for your financial situation. Number two, Proverbs teaches us to gain our wealth incrementally. In other words, don't look for some sort of a quick way to acquire wealth. Rather, go to work every day and over time, earn your money and get financially established. Don't look for a shortcut. Uh, Proverbs 12, verse 11, Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Again, Proverbs 13, verse 11, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Diligence over time is the key to your financial well-being. And so we all ought to be seeking to build wealth incrementally over time. Number three, be consistently diligent. Or you could say, uh, don't come up with excuses to skip work. Proverbs 26, verse 13, the sluggard says, there is a lion in the road, there is a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. Chapter 20, verse 13, love not sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. And so all of these Proverbs are teaching us that uh, basically, if you want to have your needs met, if you want to have your needs supplied, keep waking up, keep going to work day after day, even when you don't feel like it. Be consistent. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 9 and following says, How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. A little bit of laziness can siphon away your wealth. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little bit of calling off, a little bit of I don't feel like working today. If you keep giving in to that voice, that inner sloth, Proverbs says you will end up in poverty. And so be consistently diligent. A lot of times you're not going to feel like it, And that's what diligence is, not feeling like working and doing it anyway. 
Next, Proverbs teaches us to know our finances. Proverbs 27, verse 23. Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds, for riches do not last forever. And does a crown endure to all generations? In other words, be attentive to your financial well-being. You should know at all times roughly what's in your bank account, what's on your credit cards, what sort of debts you have, all of that. You should be paying attention to it. Uh, You should know your projected income for the next month, your projected expenses. This is part of managing money well, just being on top of it at all times. Next, Proverbs teaches us to examine our spending and look for waste that can be cut. Now, this isn't to say that you can never have a hobby, you can never spend money on you know, anything that isn't 100% necessary. But especially if you're struggling financially, this is something to look at. Is there a large amount of money being wasted, something that could and probably should be cut? Look for that waste and eliminate at least some of that. I looked up some interesting t- uh, statistics yesterday. Uh, the average American today has 12 entertainment subscriptions. That's just the average. Millennials have, on average, 17. Okay, these are things like Netflix, YouTube, all those sort of monthly subscriptions. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have any of those, but 17? (laughs) I mean, at some point, we're just getting into a lot of waste. 42% of people that were polled on this subject had monthly subscriptions that they were paying for and had completely forgot about or were no longer using them. 42%, almost half of of the American population is paying for entertainment subscriptions they don't even use. Uh, I I was at work the other day and I audibly laughed. I was listening to a podcast and there was an advertisement for a new app called Rocket Money. Uh, It's an app you pay for that will help you find and cancel your unwanted or forgotten about subscriptions. Just think about that. You're paying for an app to help you cancel those things. Uh, Proverbs 21, verse 17. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. In other words, watch out for out-of-control spending habits, waste that could and probably should be cut. Proverbs 23, verse 20 and following. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. Next, Proverbs teaches us not to be flippant about debt. Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. Be very cautious about debt. Now, I don't think uh, the Bible necessarily says it's sinful to take on any kind of debt. I don't think it's always even foolish uh, to take on debt. I certainly hope not. Uh, I've had debt in my life at times. Even now, I currently have a mortgage on my house, like a lot of people do, uh, that I pay every month. So I'm not saying you should never take on any sort of debt, but it shouldn't be done lightly. Understand that in borrowing money, you are enslaving yourself to the lender until it is paid back. You're going to have to work and earn back that money for a time until you pay that debt down. That's money that you will not be able to use for other priorities in your life. So think it through. Don't be quick uh, to get a loan, to borrow a large sum of money, to rack up credit card debt. Ask yourself if it's really worth having to work potentially for years, if we're talking about a large sum of money, to pay off that debt. And again, in some cases, something like buying a house, it may in fact be worth it. It may be wise financial management in the long run. In other situations, it may not be worth it. But whether we're talking about a loan for a house or a car or a college degree or a wedding or a credit card debt or whatever, some sort of large purchase being financed and all of that, wisdom is needed to determine, is this debt going to be a good decision in the long run or a poor choice that will cripple you financially for years to come? And so Proverbs warns us to be very cautious about debt. Uh, Don't take on debt flippantly. Next, Proverbs teaches us to save. And in particular, save during productive seasons of life. Proverbs 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. 
The ants save up their food in the summer for the coming winter. And in a similar way, a wise person will recognize that life is always subject to change in many ways that are often unforeseen. Uh, You could lose your job. You could have an expensive repair you weren't planning on. Uh, Understanding that these things could happen at any time, a wise person doesn't spend all of their resources but saves some, especially during those productive seasons of life. Proverbs 21 verse 20 says, Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. We tend to spend more rather than save more during productive seasons of life. We get a raise, and so we start buying stuff. A lot of people have fallen into this trap. They get a promotion. They now have more money than they know what to do with, and so they get a new car, they buy a bigger house, they go on expensive vacations, and then they lose that great job. Their business goes under, the economy crashes, whatever the case may be, and the money dries up. And because they assumed that that stream of income would last forever, they didn't save anything during that productive season. Generally speaking, this is the way it goes. Our spending rises with our income, which is why everyone is barely getting by. Whether you're making 30000 a year or $30 million a year, you're just barely getting by. You don't have quite enough because even with that $30 million coming in, you know, you got to pay for the maintenance on your jet and you got to pay for all the staff people that are taking care of your mansion and all that. So you're barely getting by. Now, I'm not saying never spend money, just save up everything. That's not the point. But we ought to save something during productive times. Don't constantly spend everything you make. Prepare for when life may change. Uh, In particular, if you're young, you ought to be preparing for the time when you're old and no longer able to work as you are now. Uh, Save now. Be prepared for that. Next, Proverbs teaches us to give generously to the Lord. Uh, We touched on this last week, but I want to go back and point out something in particular. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, your vats will be bursting with wine. Notice there in verse 9 the word first fruits. Uh, This would be the first bit of income that the farmers would have at the beginning of each harvest. They were to give that to the Lord. Uh, There's a clear indication of priority here. Before taking care of your stuff, Proverbs says, honor the Lord. Put him and his kingdom first. And as a result of prioritizing the Lord and giving generously, he will bless you and provide your needs. Now, uh, this next point is going to kind of help pull all of this together. Number nine, Proverbs teaches us to plan and budget. Proverbs 21, verse 5, The plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance. But everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. So you see a contrast there in two different mindsets towards your finances. One is to plan, to plan what you're going to do with your money. That's what budgeting is. Diligent work combined with diligent planning leads surely to abundance. That's a certain way to acquire wealth over your life. Work really hard, plan really well. The other way of handling money is the last half of that proverb, be hasty. No plans, just impulsive decisions. And this proverb says that everyone who is hasty with their money comes only to poverty. So wise financial management means planning and budgeting. Now, this doesn't mean you have to necessarily write everything out and, you know, print out a budget. Uh, Maybe for some of you that would be helpful, but that's not really the point. The point is not to make rash decisions, but rather to have a plan for your finances and stick to it. Your budget will give you a snapshot of your priorities. And in your budgeting, we all ought to have three things, and we've already seen these in Proverbs. Number one is providing your own living. Uh, 1 Thessalonians makes clear Christians are to provide for themselves. So all of your bills, your regular regular expenses uh, will be there. Secondly, all of us should try to save some. Now again, that's not always possible. We'll get to that in a minute. But the goal should be to save if possible. And then next, all of us should give regularly to the Lord, honoring him with our first fruits. We don't want to become uh, the rich fool that we looked at last week in the book of Luke, who stored up more and more wealth for himself and was not rich toward God. And so your budget should reflect these priorities in your life. 
Now, I hesitate to give exact percentages because it's going to be different for everyone, but to give you an idea of maybe what this would look like, you might calculate your monthly income and maybe decide to give 15%, to save 15%, and to use the leftover 70% to cover your bills and your spending. Now, again, it's not always possible. You may need 80% of your current income to cover your bills right now. Then see if you can give 10%, save 10%. That leaves you with 80% left to pay your bills and spend. Now, maybe you have debt right now that you're trying to pay down. If that's the case, instead of 10% going into savings, maybe that 10% needs to just go towards your debt until that's paid off. But here's the point. Whatever those percentages should be for you in your situation, if you don't intentionally figure out what you're going to save and what you're going to give each and every month, I can pretty much tell you what you're going to save and what you're going to give. Almost nothing. You will end up, by default, spending 99% of the money you make unless you are intentional about it. Most Americans give basically nothing and save basically nothing. They spend 100% of their income or maybe 110% of their income and they rack up credit card debt throughout their life. American Christians even today usually give just enough to not feel guilty and then they save nothing. So maybe they're spending 98%. The Bible says, give first, make that your, the first fruits, the priority, save and live on the rest and look for spending waste that can be eliminated. Be very cautious about taking on debt. Prioritize in your monthly budget, saving and giving. Don't let those just be whatever is left over because if you do that, there's going to be nothing left over. You'll end up using it for other things. Now, as we talk about these percentages to save and to give, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't really make enough to give or save hardly at all. I can barely cover my own bills, my own expenses. And I've been there. I totally get that. Uh, maybe you've looked through your spending and there's really nothing to cut. Uh, you just don't have enough income to give generously and to save a substantial amount. And I would just say that these principles are goals that you ought to aim for. Maybe you're not there yet, uh, but try to get in the habit of giving and saving at least something if you can. And over time, see if those percentages can rise. And in some cases, you may just need to look for a different job. Uh, but work to get yourself in a situation where you have enough income to provide your own living, to give generously, and to save for the future. That might mean cutting back on expensive spending habits, might mean picking up extra hours at the job, it might be, mean even looking into things like education, learning a marketing skill, uh, marketable skills so that you can have a higher paying job. But providing your own living, saving and giving should be things that we are all striving to do. Proverbs 21 verse 25, the desire of the sluggard kills him for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. According to these verses, there are those who complain about not having money. You notice in verse 25, the desire is killing him. He's craving, but it's his own fault. It's because he is not working. He's not earning more money. And then there are those who work hard and they make money and give generously. They're able to help others and give to things that are important to them because of their hard labor. These are the righteous. And the question is, which one are you? Notice the parallel between these, uh, verse 26 there, the sluggard craves and craves, the righteous gives and gives. The sluggard is focused on himself and his own needs. The righteous is focused on giving to others. And the main difference between the two is their willingness to work. Do you work hard enough to give or just to take care of yourself? And I think a lot of us are right in the middle of these two. We may not be sluggards. We're willing to labor to provide our own living, but we don't go as far as to give and not hold back. We satisfy our craving and we're content with that. Proverbs 12 verse 12 says, whoever is wicked covets the spoil of evildoers, but the root of the righteous bears fruit. So clearly there's a wicked kind of covetousness. There's a, a wickedness that drives people to just seek more and more wealth for themselves. But there's also a sincere desire of the righteous to have more income in order to use it, to give and to save and to provide. A motivation is important here. 
Covetousness or greed is when I want more money for myself and for selfish reasons. But the mindset we ought to have as Christians is what we find in Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul writes, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Notice the motivation at the end of that verse. This person is instructed to work with his own hands to earn income so that he may have something to give to those in need. Now, this goes far beyond just working to provide my own living. Now I'm also working and earning a little extra that I don't need so that I can have something to give to others. So that's planning and budgeting. We should arrange our finances in a way that reflects our priorities in life, intentionally using some of our money to give to others and honor the Lord, and ideally saving some as well, especially during productive seasons of our life. Next, Proverbs teaches us to invest wisely in things that will provide a return in the future. Uh, one of the best places to see this is in Proverbs chapter 31, the description of the virtuous woman. Uh, we won't read all of this, but among other things that are said about her, verse 16 says, She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Here she is making an investment in the future. She is purchasing a field, knowing that in the end it will produce more money for her. If you keep reading through that chapter, she's involved in several things like this. Involved in uh, purchasing wool and flax, making clothing, selling to merchants. Uh, and she basically uses her income in exactly the ways that Proverbs describes, being generous to the poor and needy. Uh, really, that whole 31st chapter of Proverbs describes in a nutshell everything Proverbs says about wise financial stewardship. But investing money is a concept uh, that comes up a few times in Scripture, and it's always portrayed as a wise practice. For example, there's the parable of the talents that Jesus told in Matthew 25, beginning with verse 14. He says, It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. And these talents are very large sums of money that they're being given uh, basically stewardship over. It's their job to manage it while the master is away. Verse 16, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So this would be uh, trading, investing in some ways, and increasing uh, the wealth that he had. Verse 17, so also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enjoy, uh, enter into the joy of your master. He also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I uh, scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now, of course, the primary lesson of that parable is a spiritual one, but we can also learn from it the wisdom of investing and trading money in order to gain a return, multiplying our money through wise investments. Now, of course, that takes some work, uh, some education on our part to figure out what wise investment looks like. Uh, but there are general principles of diversifying investments, looking for investments that earn uh, predictable returns over time. These are 
pretty much universally considered to be wise financial practices. And this is exactly in line with how Proverbs calls us to think, to exercise foresight, to prepare for the future, uh, to save during productive seasons of our life and invest wisely to see a return in the future. And for many of us, we don't want to do this because we simply struggle with delayed gratification. Things like saving and investing means I have to set aside some of my money that could be spent and enjoyed right now and instead set it aside, prepare it for the future. And all of this leads to the last point that Proverbs teaches us. Number 11, seek to leave an inheritance. As you get older, invest in those coming behind you. Proverbs 13 verse 22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. And again, this just solidifies a point that we made uh, last week, that wealth isn't bad in and of itself. It depends on what you're doing with it. Here, Proverbs says, a good man leaves an inheritance. Money is a tool that can be used in good, wise, and God-glorifying ways. And one of those wise uses of money is to leave some behind for others. We should be seeking to be generous with our wealth, including saving some to leave behind when we die. So then, let's kind of wrap all of this up together. If money is a tool, we need to know what it's for, how to use it. We need to know its function. We need to have clear goals in our minds so that we know what we're trying to accomplish with our finances. And there may be some who have slightly different goals than others, but as Christians, much of our use of money should be guided by the principles of Scripture that we've looked at. So here are, I'm just going to share with you some of my own goals with my money. You can come up with your own. Uh, Number one, make as much money as I can without getting distracted from other important things in my life. In other words, I don't want to get so absorbed in the pursuit of wealth that I neglect uh, my wife, that I neglect my job here as a pastor or some other important area of my life. Uh, But I do want to make money. This is a biblical principle throughout Proverbs, the hand of the diligent makes rich. It is not a Christian virtue to make little to no money and be poor. That's not a good thing. Make a lot of money, but then make sure you're using it in ways that honor God. And so you can have to give to the one in need, as Ephesians says. Uh, Our church is open because of people who make money. That's the reality of every church. Somebody is paying for stuff. If you don't make hardly anything, you can't really help much in those endeavors. It is pleasing to the Lord to work diligently, to make money, and then to use it in ways that serve him and his kingdom. More on that in a minute. Number two, another goal that I have is never to be a burden on others. I want to provide my own living even in my old age. Uh, This would include things like planning when you're young and saving for retirement. Uh, I bought a house early in life in order to hopefully pay it off and not have a mortgage later. I don't want to uh, be a burden on others later in my life. I don't want others having to pay my expenses at any point in my life if I can help it. Uh, Whether it's my family having to care for me or the government, either way, uh, I do not want that. Number three, I want to give as much as I can to the kingdom of God. At different times in my life, that has looked differently, and no doubt it will in the future. But I don't want to be the rich fool who dies having a lot of money saved up and having not been rich towards God. I want to honor the Lord and my commitment and devotion to him with my wealth. Number four, I want to have money to give at my death. I think it's a good goal to die with something left to pass on to others. Number five, I want to guard against debt as much as possible. Uh, Another way of saying that would be I want to pay as little interest as possible in my life. And that has sort of informed a lot of my decisions. Uh, Things like purchasing a car and a house, even the timing in which I did that. And even now, one of my main goals financially is to get my house paid off so I can be completely debt-free as soon as possible. So guard against debt as much as possible. Number six, I want to never let money become the end goal of my life. Money is a tool. It's something we all need. But I don't want my life to get wrapped up in simply acquiring more and more wealth. I don't want money to become an idol. And then number seven, I want to maintain a good reputation. Uh, This includes things like a good credit score, 
never being late paying a bill or a credit card, never being evicted from a house because I couldn't make a payment. Uh, Christians should have a good reputation. We should be known as people who are responsible financially, that honor our obligations and pay our debts on time. So those are some of my goals with money, and maybe uh, for, your, for you it would take to just take a minute and think through some of your own goals. I think that would be a, a wise thing for each of us to do. If we aren't intentional with how we handle finances, we will very likely end up making foolish decisions. It takes diligence and planning to use money well. And it takes an ultimate devotion to God to keep money from becoming an idol in our life. May God help all of us to be wise in how we manage our money. Let's pray together.